my 
Father God, we come to you expecting that today is going to be the best day of our lives. Oh, Father God, we ask that you touch every ear that's going to hear the word, oh God. 
We ask that you just have your way with us, oh God. Oh, Father God, we ask that you touch the sick and the shutting, oh God. Oh, Father God, that you just bless our nation in the mighty name of Jesus, oh God. But we're asking that you come through to this branch of Zion, oh God. Asking that you heal, set free, and deliver, oh God. You know the needs of your people, oh God. Oh, Father God, we just say move, oh God. Move by your spirit, not by might, but it's by your spirit, oh God. So we say we're open vessels, oh God. All these things we lift up to you. We say, have your way with our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord, everybody. And let us exalt his name together. We want to thank you for joining us today for East Friendship Live. At East Friendship, we invite you to our community to get to know God, find freedom, and discover your purpose, and make a difference. Here are ways you can continue to grow with us in this season and get connected to the East Friendship family. Spring is here, and we are in our second season of prayer and fasting for the year. We're only on day three of the season of 21 days of fasting and prayer, and there is still time for you to join us each and every morning from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. for corporate prayer, and from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. on Facebook Live with Pastor Max. You can download your season's prayer journal on Realm from our Between Friends newsletter or email our team at push at efbchurch.org. Again, push at efbchurch.org to join in. The world needs our prayers now more than ever before. The Bible tells us to study to show ourselves approved. Have you been studying God's word? Set aside a little extra time and join us for the new school experience. Sundays weekly on Zoom before service at 9 a.m. Now this isn't your average Sunday school, so see flyers for details. Ladies, praise the Lord. You know we are not going to let this coronavirus stop us from celebrating our beautiful ladies. Women's Day is going digital. So join us on Sunday, May 17th, 2020 at 10 a.m. on Facebook Live and YouTube. Now we are going to dress to impress in our diamonds and denim. Now to help us show our pride, I want you to take your best selfie and with the ladies in your family and invite your girlfriends to join in and tag us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at East Friendship using hashtag EF Women's Day. Ladies, we are going to worship and praise God together for keeping us for another year with our special guest, Dr. Keisha J. Agar and our wow, you know, women of worship. Now we are asking all ladies to contribute a $100 seed of appreciation for this special season. And for more information, just stay tuned on RIM and in our Between Friends digital newsletter and you will be informed. Well, that's all for now. And we will see you there in your Sunday's best. So stay safe and God bless you. We're all at home together and we know our kids and youth are longing for true connection. We've carved out a space just for them to spread their wings and still remain connected to the vine. KKC and Raw are going live on Zoom every Sunday at 7 p.m. Join us this evening for communion and let's talk. Come as you are, but come ready to talk. I mean, real talk. While our church is under construction, we're inviting you to join our Pew Rally and pledge your contributions at any time from now through to September 30, 2020. Choose to make your contribution today via cash, check, Gilify, or Realm by choosing Pew Rally when you give. Hey, 
services isn't over yet. Now is the time where you can reach out and touch someone from right where you are. Join us in giving via text to give, Givelify, Realm, or Classic Mail, so that our church will continue to be able to make a difference in the lives of our ever-growing community. You can also join us now in sharing this video by clicking share right at the bottom of your screen. And help us to spread the good news that God is still speaking and doing miracles around the world and right here at East Friendship. Now, let's get back to our service. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm just so glad to come via cyberspace and this virtual experience to reach all of you and celebrate the Lord's Supper, one of the two ordinances of the Baptist Church. We know due to COVID-19, this terrible pandemic, we won't be able to do baptism to a consolidated time in the future, but we can do the Lord's Supper together. I do want to afford all of you the opportunity to go get your bread or cracker, uh, your juice or fruit of the vine, so we can sup and commune together. Amen. While you're doing that, I just want to thank uh, my beloved brother, Pastor Anthony Moore, and the Carolina Church family and all their staff for affording us the opportunity to do worship and to be able to have a safe place to have worship and to reach out to you. And so I'm so grateful for all of them and even the staff of East Friendship that's been behind the scenes working so hard to make sure that we can bring you our worship experience. And it has been a tremendous experience. I hear amen out there somewhere. Uh, grab your wine, please, your fruit of the vine. Some of you got some wine. I know you do. Grab your bread and let me consecrate it and pray over it. Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to commune via this virtual experience, to break bread together, to, Father, bind together in Christian love. We are grateful for the body of Christ, the ship of Zion called each friendship for all of our Men, women, children, elders, mature adults, young adults, we thank you, Father, that we can now come together and break bread together. Consecrate the bread, Father, that's a symbol of your body. Consecrate, Father, the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood shed on Golgotha's hill. Consecrate each of us, Father, who are believers, who are taking now this Lord's Supper. We don't want to take it, Father, uh, unto damnation because we're not saved, but because we are saved, we are taking it, God, to honor what you have taught us to do. Bless right now, sanctify it in Jesus' name. Let the people of God say amen. I was so glad to already consecrate my hands and to wash them, and so let us now enter into this space. It was on that faithful day that our Lord and Savior gathered around the table uh, many were there. There was a betrayer at the table. There was a doubter at the table. There was one who would deny him even at the table. But Jesus moved on his kingdom mission and gathered with his disciples in the upper room. And he took the bread, representing his body, lifted it to the Father and blessed it and said, This is my body that is broken for you, broken for your iniquities and minds, broken for your sins and minds. Likewise, he took the cup filled with the fruit of the vine, representing the blood that be poured out for your sins and minds. He said, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And let us now grab hold of the bread, take it, and eat of it. Likewise now, take the cup filled with the fruit of the vine, drink of it.
scripture says, after taking and drinking, they sang a song and went out. But, you know, we're not going to sing the song and go out. We're going to sing the song and have church now. So why don't you just greet your family member that's right there in front of you. If you're single, just greet somebody on Zoom. Greet somebody on Facebook, YouTube. Uh, shout them out via text. But greet somebody and say, I love you. I'm so glad that you are walking with me through this pandemic. Uh, hug somebody on every side. And thank God for the opportunity to break bread together.
so wonderful to be able to touch you uh, virtually and through cyberspace. And so I want you all to grab your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 14, verse 43 through 47. Again, we are in the Overcoming Life Sermon Series. Uh, it's been just a blessing to all of us, and I just want you to join me today in the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 14, looking at verse 43 and 47. One more time, that's Mark 14, verse 43 to 47. My Bible is a King James Bible, and it reads thusly, And immediately, while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whosoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goes straightway to him and said, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. This is the word of God for the people of God. Blessed be the name of our God. If you're standing, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord at this time. I want to tag this text. Dear Judas, in retrospect, thank you. Oh, Lord, did you get that? Dear Judas, in retrospect, thank you. Mark begins and ends his gospel with schism, a division, a parting, a rending. The schism of heavens is chapter 1, verse 10. The schism of the veil in the temple, chapter 15, verse 38. These two schisms, these two dramatic tearings and renderings, form, as it were, the boards of the bookmark. The front cover, God splits the heavens. The back cover splits the veil of the temple. In between the boards of the book of Mark, in between the schisms, lies the vigorous, rapid-moving, dynamic gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as Mark prefaces in chapter 1, verse 1. If we, each of us here, view the schism of the heavens and the schisms of the veil as a literary bracket which envelopes the shortest of the four gospels, then within these brackets, inside the shortest of these gospels, in, inside this good news of Jesus of Nazareth and the good news of the kingdom he brings. Listen to the voice of Jesus in Mark's gospel. Do you hear it? It is staccato of words and deeds, like a cha -da 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 -da, machine gun cadence of voice and action. He proclaims the kingdom. He declares the kingdom in parables. He demonstrates the kingdom in miracles. He displays the kingdom uh, in power and anointing. And from verse 1 through 14 on, Mark's gospel is ablaze with the presence of the kingdom of God. From 1, 14 on, Mark's gospel presents a Jesus who is active, uh, after Mark's prologue, uh, through the beginning of Mark's epilogue, Jesus is active and talkative, moving to and fro, doing his thing like nobody can do his thing. And the kingdom comes in a rapid panorama of action and speech, in a flurry of words and deeds. And at the center of the kingdom is Christ. At the center of this gospel is Christ. At the center of Mark's revelation to you and me is Christ. That who Mark, that's who Mark wants us to see. He wants us to see Jesus. Jesus at the center. Jesus as the focus. Jesus as the heart of the Christian faith. Mark's demand is to speak to Romans, particularly about the Son of Man and the Son of God. Jesus. Now, the climax of the action is fast-moving gospel is the final battle and the last encounter. The final conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. This is why we are focusing on Judas. Because throughout Mark's gospel, the Son of God has marched the kingdom uh, in an invasion of the fortress of Satan. Back and forth from Galilee to Judea, the king advances his kingdom in word and deed and spirit against the forces of darkness. Now the climax, the hour of darkness and the hour and the power thereof. Satan plays his trump card, death to the Son of God. The last battle is waged on a hill in a city at a cross. Satan will be active. Christ will be passive. Satan minions will do the talking, accusing, convicting, lying. 
Christ will be silent. Satan's servants will be acting, arresting and dragging and mocking and spitting and nailing. But he will never say a mumbling word. But before we get there, we have to witness the schism, the tearing, the rendering of the inner circle of Jesus. The 12 loyal men who are his disciples are beginning to break down and it starts with Judas. Now the setting shifts from the upper room of Gethsemane and an olive grove of the outskirts of the city. And here, uh, uh, in two major scenes, the pace of the passion story quickens. Can I say that one more time? The setting shifts from the upper room to Gethsemane and an olive grove on the outskirts of the city. And right there, the pace of the passion story quickens. The chief priests and the scribes are the political and religious leaders working behind the scenes to crucify Jesus. They were also keenly aware that Pilate had experienced 32 riots in his 10 years as governor of Judea, and the Jewish leaders wanted to avoid one more riot. So their ultimate goal was to kill Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus had become a serious threat to their way of life and to their way of religion. So the vantage point of Gethsemane is directly across the hillside from the main exit of Jerusalem. In relation to it being a strategic site from a human perspective to hide and to pray, the Olive Garden was absolutely, probably the wrong place. But the specter of violent death hovers over Jesus and torments him. And as he had done several times in the gospel, Jesus gathers his strength through and in prayer. It's not a polite or heroic prayer, but one that echoes the raw expression of faith found in the, the Psalms. Abba, Father. All things are possible to you. Take this cup from me, but not what I will, but what you will. So much of the spirit of Jesus is here. His tenacious and intimate devotion to God, his Abba, the fierce struggles with the power of evil and death that marked his ministry in Galilee is here in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was the very place where Judas knew he can find Jesus. If Jesus did not want to be found, he could have gone any place else to the desolation or even back to Galilee. Instead, Jesus goes to a place that Judas knew well and where Judas can easily find him. Essentially, Jesus turned himself in for our sins. <laughs> we had a death penalty, but he took on our punishment. He did not fall into a trap. He marched right into it. Geographically, if you look at it and analyze the text, the pericope says everything. Jesus would be able to see the soldiers and their torches following Judas out of the gates of Jerusalem. He's not ignorant that they're coming down the Kindred Valley and up to the hillside of the garden where Jesus waited. I couldn't imagine how much strength it must have been taken for Jesus to continue praying as the torches of those soldiers crossed the valley and started uphill. And while he fled, well, while we flee from the consequences of our own sin, Jesus, look at him now, stood ground, stood his ground, and took the consequences for our sins for us. Mm -hmm. uh, you may not want to hear this this morning, but I, I want to let you know everybody needs a Judas in their life. I, I know you don't want to hear it, but everybody needs a Judas. And if you don't have one, live a little while. He or she will show up. Everybody, I said, needs a Judas. There are several things that Judas teaches us. First, Judas teaches us to keep the kiss in the right perspective. Secondly, keep the money in the rightful place. And finally, keep your focus on the real purpose. Can I say that one more time? Uh, the text teaches us and Judas teaches us uh, to keep the kiss in the right uh, perspective and keep the money in the rightful place and keep your focus on the real purpose. Mm, yes, I, I said it. I said it. Keep the kiss in the right perspective. Be careful where and who you put your lips on and who you allow to put their lips on you. The person you kissing may be the very one that will do the most damage in your life. Don't be quick to kiss somebody. Can I say it that way? Girl, he kissed me and I forgot my name. You know he said that. Oh, I exhale when I, he kissed me for the first time. Or the brother, she, she kissed me with those thick lips and I just hyperventilated. Well, be careful who you allow to kiss you, but also keep that kiss in perspective. Anyone who has ever been kissed knows that the sensations involved aren't confined to the mouth. Your facial nerves carry uh, impulses between your brain and the muscles and, and the skin of your face and your tongue. 
And so while you kiss, it carries a message from the lips, tongue, and the face to your brain to tell it what's going on. Your brain responds by ordering your body to produce some hormones, Lord have mercy, a toxicin, which helps people develop feelings of attachment, devotion, and affection for one another, dopamine, which plays a role in the brain, processing emotions and pleasures and pain, serotonin, which affects a person's mood and feelings, and adrenaline, which increases the heart rate and it plays a role in your body's fight or flight response. So when you kiss, these hormones and neurotransmitters rush through your body. Along with the natural endorphins, they produce the euphoria most people feel during a kiss. In addition, your heart rate increases and your blood vessels dilate, so your whole body receives more oxygen than it does when you're standing around. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. You can also smell the person you're kissing. And researchers have demonstrated connection between smells and emotion. Keep the kiss, I'm trying to tell you, in perspective. You see, in the text, and even today, kissing played a major role in the early Christian church. Christians often greeted one another with the osculum pasis. That is, it's the holy kiss. And according to this tradition, the holy kiss caused a transfer, don't miss it, of a spirit between the two people kissing. And most researchers believe that the purpose of the kiss was to establish a familiar bond between the members of the church and, and to strengthen the community. Mm, you really to tell me, Pastor Maxwell, that kissing strengthens the community? Yeah, it strengthens the community. But you got to be careful who you let lay lips on you and who you lay lips on. Uh, until 1528, the Holy Kiss was part of the Catholic Mass. And in the 13th century, the Catholic Church substituted the Pax Board, which the congregation kissed instead of kissing one another. Then the Protestant Reformation that we're part of, uh, the 1500s removed the kiss <laughs> from the Protestant service entirely. So the Holy Kiss doesn't typically play a role in the modern religious services, although some Christians do uh, kiss religious symbols, including the Pope ring. I'm saying all of this to say that uh, uh, that, that kiss Kiss is very important. So Judas comes to kiss Jesus to identify Jesus, but he's also kissing him as he's a family member. He's also kissing him uh, because there's a spirit between them. And sometimes you got to be careful who you allow kiss you uh, to kiss you because you can transfer spirits. And your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost uh, will not allow just any spirit to come inside where he's dwelling. I'm trying to help somebody here who takes kisses out of perspective. Uh, a lot of us are kissing the wrong people on the wrong day, at the wrong place, at the wrong time. And too many of us are allowing people to lay hand, lay, lay lips on people and lay hands on people. And we should be careful how we allow people to touch us. Maybe the pandemic is there to teach us some new habits. Uh, maybe we realize that we just can't put our hands anywhere, put our lips everywhere. Maybe we need to rethink our approach to this because Judas betrayed Jesus uh, with a kiss. The Bible lets us know that Judas began to look for an opportunity to betray him way before he got in the garden, way before the garden scene. Judas began looking for a good moment, listen, to betray Jesus. And when the crowd would not be present, how, how I wish I, I could scorn Judas the man who portrayed Jesus with a kiss, yet the only response I can muster is shame. Shame for the many times I've walked with Jesus, claimed him as Lord, boasted of being a disciple, then I betrayed him with a kiss. Jesus and God receive many kisses from us today. We praise him. Every time we praise, we're kissing God. We're, we're lifting up God. We, we theologize. Uh, we, we join churches. We adopt responsible positions on national and international political issues. But we are so caught up within the iron vice of our secular, materialistic, hedonistic perspective that God of Jesus is like illicit mistress or lover whom we like Judas kiss in the dark. Uh, we treat Jesus. Uh, uh, we kiss him in the dark. And sometimes we kiss him to let people see that we're connected to him when we're really not connected to him. Uh, Y'all don't want to hear that today. Y'all don't want me to preach this sermon, but I'm going to preach the hell out of it anyway. However, the presence of God in the daylight working will only disrupt our labor, embarrass our fellow workers. You see, you got to keep kisses in perspective. You got to understand uh, that, that, that kisses should not have the a power to change your mind even about God. Uh, kisses should not be able to uh, 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 change uh, 
uh, who you seen. Uh, you probably was right the first time when you assessed who that person was, but when they gave you a kiss, you start rethinking it. But no, no, trust your instincts and trust the discernment that the Holy Spirit uh, has told you. See, Jesus knew who Jesus Judas was. He knew uh, that he had a mission uh, to destroy him. He knew and he allowed him to be at his table. He knew and he allowed him to carry the purse, uh, but, but he even allowed him to kiss him because he was kissing him into his mission. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, secondly, uh, not only do you need to keep the kiss in right perspective, uh, keep the money in the rightful place. See, of Jesus' close followers, Judas had left him. Judas was the first one out of all of his close followers to leave Jesus. Different from Luke where Satan enters into Judas in Luke 22 and 3, and in John where the motive is greed. Mark traces Judas' betrayal to a disagreement over Jesus' mission found in Mark 14, 3, 3 through 10. You may recall Jesus was anointed with some expensive nard or perfume worthy of a year's wage, and some, including G Judas, got angry with the excessiveness and complained and stated it should have been sold and the money given to the poor. But Jesus praised the woman who anointed him, saying that she anointed my body beforehand for burial and added that wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, uh, this woman, uh, had, what she did would be told in remembrance of her. But Judas then sought out the leaders of the temple in order to betray Jesus for money, especially since Jesus proposed that the Son of Man must suffer and die. Judas' concern was money. And we know that money or the love of money is the root of all evil. It's interesting when I look at that, the love of money, the, the root of all evil. And I'm trying to tell you, uh, keep the money in its rightful place because uh, the enemy can turn you as you pursue money. The enemy can use you and manipulate you when you try to get money all the time, hunting after money, trying to make some Benjamins. Uh, and all of us got to make some. But when you start loving it to a point where you're willing to put even Jesus up for sale, uh, there's a problem. Uh, you got to keep money in its rightful place because it's the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. I would think Satan is the root of all evil. Uh, but the scripture is telling us that we need to be careful of mammon. Uh, choose this day who you will serve. Will it be God or mammon? Be careful of what, what we consume and, and pursue because it can trick you to do some crazy things when you have a love of money. Look at look, 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 look at it. In John's account of this incident, we hear the reliable account that Judas was a thief at his heart. Judas is a thief, and he's representing the thief of all thieves. Judas keep the common purse for the disciples, and that he used to steal from the common purse. In other words, Judas had been a thief a long, long time, uh, and actually stole from Jesus and from the other disciples. What kind of person would steal from Jesus? Judas' love of money must have become compulsively addictive. His material greediness must have consumed his inner passions. It is no wonder that Judas, who was a compulsive thief, betrayed and sold Jesus for merely 30 pieces of silver, which was the price of a slave. Oh, I'm trying to take you somewhere. That moment of crisis comes swiftly. Judas and an armed crowd break into the stillness of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus. The apostate the, the, uh, disciple identifies Jesus with a treacherous kiss and mayhem breaks out. They seize Jesus and arrest him. And meanwhile, a bystander, one of the crowd, one of the followers, lashes out with a sword and wounds the servant high priest. You see, I'm trying to tell you, uh, stop letting money rule you. Stop letting money drive you because it'll cause a lot of chaos to break out. Stop letting money uh, control you because it'll make you lose your mind. And see, Judas uh, was the only Judean uh, at all the disciples. The rest were Galileans. So Jude Judeans are close to uh, the, the religious establishment. And Jud Judas had a, a lot of knowledge about theology, but yet his theology couldn't hold him because he had a uh, money. Money in the wrong place in his heart. And so when you consume with money uh, and you're willing to betray even Jesus with a kiss, it can lead to a lot of chaos. Satan had got into the heart and the habits of Judas. Oh, that's what he's trying to do today. Satan is always trying to find what chip that you have inside your spirit that he can put a joystick and control and joy draw you in. Satan is trying to find your proclivities and your habits and circumstances and situations where he can enter in and sift you. Uh, you you can be with Jesus for three years, uh, walking with him, talking with him, preaching with him, being his treasure, and still get lost. Mm. Satan got into his habits and, uh, and his heart. We also recall that Judas had been stealing money from Jesus, 
the other disciples in the common purse for some time. Uh, yeah, yeah, somebody who, who was morally sick, morally bankrupt, whose heart and actions had become morally perverted. Judas had become addicted and consumed by greed. But if I had to write Judas a, le a letter, I, I would say, dear Judas, in retrospect, thank you. Thank you for all you did to get Jesus to the cross. Thank you for your role uh, that Satan used you, but you Satan was being used by God. Uh, thank you uh, for, for being uh, who you are, because uh, if you wasn't who you are, uh, Scripture would not have been fulfilled. And see, Satan had got into the hearts and habits of Judas, uh, and, and, and he began to move in a different place, and he left them, and Jesus at the table said, Judas, Harry, go do what you got to do. You see, what I really want to bring out in the Judas presence uh, and the highlights of all these disciples' reality is the proclivity to sin. Jesus states around the Lord's Supper table that one of you will betray me, and each disciple, the Bible records, said, Lord, is it I? This lets us know there's a little bit of Judas in all of us. All of us can become a Judas. After all the preaching, after all the Sunday school classes, after all the choir rehearsals, after all the praise and worship songs, after all the times we've been hanging in the presence of the Lord, after all the anointings we have, after all the giftings that we have, you mean to tell me we can be like Judas? Yes, you can be like Judas. If you surrender your proclivities and habits and give access to the enemy to consume you, and one of the things that leads to consumption is the love of money. Preachers love money so much. Too many of us are entertaining for the money. We're more about building empires to ourselves and not to God. Judas was more interested in moving Jesus to his mission to take over the Roman Empire. Because underneath who Judas really is, uh, uh, he was one of the underground members of the Judaic persons who, who, who pursued uh, and fought uh, against the Roman Empire. Uh, he, he, he constantly wanted to move Jesus to his mission, uh, but he lost himself because he had one bad habit. He loved money more than anything else in the world. And so listen, all have good and bad and wrong and right in us, but stop looking at Judas, and maybe we all need to also look at ourselves, because all of us may have a little Judas in us. I'll close this sermon now because I'm hoping that you keep the kiss in the right perspective, and maybe even in the midst of a pandemic, unemployment, and all the things that's going on in all of our lives right now, maybe we need to make sure we keep money in its rightful place. But finally, keep your focus on the real purpose. You see, everybody needs a Judas. Judas did more for Christ's purpose than any of his disciples. Judas is one's life makes you aware of the Johns in your life. See, see there's a Judas and there's a John. You appreciate a John uh, who's a disciple that Jesus loved because you have a contrast. You have a Judas, and Judas highlights the need for the Johns. Uh, Judas is one's life makes you aware of Johns in your life, uh, makes you value some friends who you thought was once was boring and routine, but they were consistent and reliable and committed. It makes you focus on being effective versus being busy. Gets you away from just running around preaching for anybody, avoiding having to deal with people and trying to avoid even how to deal with your family. Uh, like have sex without intimacy. Uh, that, that's what Judas does for us. He, he, he makes us uh, be in relationship with God uh, and to be close to him uh, and not just uh, have uh, a, a, a physical relationship without having intimacy. See, Judas was so close to Jesus, uh, he was the treasurer, but he didn't have true intimacy intimacy with Jesus and too many church folk are uh, like a brother or a sister who's more interested in their own fulfillment who wants sex without intimacy and they have ministry without engagement they got praise without power uh, they got ushering without grace uh, we got too many people in the church uh, uh, who needs to focus on the real purpose see the specific reason made different from age to age, from nation to nation. But we Americans want God uh, because we do so very well without him. We, we, we say we want him, but we can handle our business ourselves. We can create uh, social media and technology and AI and artificial intelligence and deep learning. 
We can do so many things uh, with biological warfare. Uh, we can create even a pandemic uh, that has been placed around in a country to cause a whole nation and the globe to shut down. Uh, we, 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 we Americans can do so many other things. Uh, but the memory of former dependence on God simply encumbers our modern worldliness. You see, Judas was so around Jesus he really began to get to a place where he, he didn't need Jesus, that he can change things on his own, uh, that, that he, he can make Jesus purpose by accelerating his purpose and push Jesus into taking over the Roman Empire and slaying his enemy. You see, God has never successfully, uh, in the way we understand it, brought peace to the earth yet. Uh, there'll be peace over here and somebody will say peace, but God said, no, the peace will not uh, come to fulfillment because until the kingdom is fully established in earth. And Jesus won wanted to make sure that we recognize that he's the prince of peace. But Judas, uh, he was flooded uh, with control. He was flooded uh, with, with his own purpose and he missed the kingdom purpose, uh, the real purpose that Jesus came onto the earth. He was born to die, to suffer for your sins and my sins. He's the lamb of God that take away the sins of all the world. Uh, he we stretched her wide and hung high and he would die on, on a rugged cross, put in a borrowed tomb and then raise up on the third day. Hey, 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 with all power in his hands. Uh, and then listen here, it doesn't just stop there. Uh, then he ascends to the Father, he sends the Holy Ghost, Lord Jesus, uh, to give us power to be able to navigate the world, and then one day he's coming at back for a church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That's his purpose. And too many of us uh, get caught up in our own purpose the closer we get to Jesus. We need to be get caught up in his purpose, and we should be asking Jesus how we join you, Jesus, in the earth and what you doing. How, how Jesus, can I serve in my church and join you what you're doing in the East Friendship Church? How can I join you, Jesus, in what you're doing? And then brother, sister, sister, brother, life. How can I join you, Jesus, in what you're doing with our children? And see, we are joining Jesus in his purpose. Judas, I thank you. Uh, I didn't like you at all when I read the Bible, but I realized that you was even part of the purpose. You were an instrument in God's hand. You were being used for his glory. You were one that pushed him uh, to his kingdom move. You were used. And I'll stop by here on this day to let you know that nothing escapes the eyes of God. That God knows how to even use a Judas. And so you don't have to be afraid of Judas. Uh, keep your Judas close to you. You don't have to be afraid of Judas. Uh, give Judas an assignment. You don't have to be afraid of Judas. You just need to stick close to God and know that you have an intimate relationship with him. So intimate that you can not only blow kisses at him, but you can kiss him every day with your worship, your purpose, your real purpose, created to worship God. Judas missed it. Keep the kiss in right perspective. Keep money in his rightful place because the love of money, oh my God, is the root of all evil. And keep your focus on the real purpose, not just your purpose, but Jesus' purpose for coming, dying, rising, and coming back again. Beloved, I believe that Jesus is trying to reach all of us through the Judas paradigm. And I want to invite you, maybe it's you that this sermon is written for. They've been chasing after money, chasing after someone to intimately kiss you, wanting to have someone to love you and to walk with you in the earth, an earthen vessel. All of us need one. But sometimes we let people come into our life that's been assigned by the enemy to kiss us and destroy our life. But I'm so glad that Jesus knew who Judas was even before the foundations of the world. So that's why you need to be close to him. That's why today you need to make a decision to allow Jesus to come into your life. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that he died for your sins and mine, rose on the third day with all power in his hand and sitting at the right hand of the Father, 
making intercession even now for you. Will you come and surrender your life? Right there virtually you can come. You can send us a heart or thumbs up or you can let us know that you heard this word and maybe you've been betrayed by a kiss in your life. You thought it was real love and you missed the opportunity to experience the love of God. A God that says I'll never leave you or forsake you. A God who died rose and even love you this much that he would now dwell in you because he wants to be into you. He wants to be so intimate with you. I invite you now to give your life to him. If you never made a public profession, you can do it right here virtually. Just shout out to us right now. Let us know where you are. Amen, my brothers and sisters. Amen. Let us know. Send us a message. Send us your name. We'll make sure that our kingdom track persons get a hold of you, our ministers, our deacons. They're working right now. They'll follow you. They will make sure they reach out to you. My God, he's an awesome God. There's some of you here today who already have a personal relationship with Jesus, but you don't have a church home. This may be the first time you joined or even got near a church virtually. The church came to your home. Well, you may have church hurt. You may have a difficult moment you're going through, but I want you to know that there is a branch of Zion that will love you into the kingdom. We help people to come to know God, find freedom, discover their purpose, and make a difference. That's it right there, to help you to know God intimately for yourself, help you to find freedom. We get you out of Egypt, then we get Egypt out of you and help you to really to discover your purpose, your passion, your spiritual gifts, and then deploy you to go make a difference by serving God, not only in the church, but in his kingdom and even into the world. So we want to invite you even now to come join us. Let's go on a journey together because God wants to do a work in your life. Oh, how wonderful it is. Every one of us need a Judas it helps you to find out who really is the John in your life. I'm so glad that you spent this time with us. God bless you. It's time to bid you farewell. Remember, maybe you just write a letter to Judas. Dear Judas, in retrospect, I thank you because God was using you even in spite of you. And that's the God that we know. We bid you farewell. Peace and love. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you on Wednesday. God bless you.